Good afternoon. Let's do some business. We are doing it live right here, doing more at four weekday afternoons. We get right down to business with the News Driven Hour right after Ben Shapiro and just before the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang at 5. Motec on Money, live on the air now, 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide at kbc.com and the on-demand Motec on Money podcast, kbc.com, Apple iTunes, and all your favorite podcast platforms. Well, stocks ending the day lower today, weighed down by tech names, including the 20% drop in shares of Salesforce following the earnings news that came out yesterday. The Dow came in for a closing loss of 330 points. The S&P 500 slipped 31, and the Nasdaq ended 183 points lower. The Dow seeing its third straight day of losses, now down 2.5% for the biggest three-day drop we've seen since last October. It's been uh, quite a month for the blue chips. Uh, we see we have just one more trading day left in the month of May, and looks like certainly in the last half of the month, some uh, people have sold in May, have maybe gone away. The, the Dow captured the headlines just a couple of weeks ago when it moved above 40,000 for the first time, and it's been slipping for the past couple of weeks now. Stocks have been sliding as benchmark Treasury note yields have been rising lately, including the yield in the 10-year note, which now stands at 4.55%. That's the one that impacts the fixed rate mortgage rates. And you guessed it, mortgage rates have posted the biggest increase in more than a month, propelling the yield of the uh, rate on the 30 year fix now back over 7%, according to the latest survey released today by mortgage giant Freddie Mac. The average 30 year fix now averages 7.03%. The average rate on the 15 year fix is now 6.36%. That's also higher from the past week. Investors looking for more reasons to be cautious about the health of the software sector. Just got a big one today on that uh, Salesforce earnings news. They cut their subscription revenue outlook and discussed heavy scrutiny on spending as a part of its customers. And it uh, looks like Salesforce shares, the ticker symbol on that one, by the way, is CRM, dropping nearly 20% today. The stock fell representing uh, Salesforce's largest single-day percentage drop since uh, about a 27% drop back in 2004. The price of oil slipping today. We'll be watching what's happening uh, with OPEC this weekend. They're getting set for a big meeting. And uh, we see West Texas Intermediate crude trading in New York down $1.74 to 81 uh, Let's see, actually to um, $77.91 a barrel. It's the Brent crude in London that's still above 80 down $1.74 today to $81.86 a barrel. Brent crude uh, moving Moving uh, lower today in Europe and uh, in uh, New York, we saw the price down $1.32 at $77.91 a barrel. Well, after the closing bell this afternoon came that legal and political earthquake you've been hearing about. President Donald Trump becoming the first former president to be convicted of felonies. As a New York jury found him guilty of falsifying business records, President Trump is expected to quickly appeal that verdict. There are no campaign rallies on the calendar for now. Those expected to hold fundraisers next week. And as CNBC notes, now that his criminal trial in New York is wrapped up with a guilty verdict, former president is plowing ahead with a packed schedule of fundraising events that will likely raise millions of dollars for his presidential campaign. He's no longer required to sit in court every day as he's been for the past couple of months. And by the way, we see uh, shares of the uh, Trump media stock down as much as 15 percent here now in extended after hours trading. It turns out 93% of Americans are worried about inflation. After nearly two years now, Fed, the Fed raising interest rates to more than 20-year highs and sending credit card rates to all-time highs. Inflation is still running hotter than the Fed's 2% target. A new survey has just been done focusing how consumers are reacting in the face of the still hot inflation. I'll talk about that later this hour with Daisha Milden, staff editor for CNET Money. Also this hour, Romina Bacha, Director of Budget and Entitlements Policy at the Cato Institute, will join me with an update on Uncle Sam's credit card bill, America's mounting debt challenge, made even worse in recent years by so-called emergency spending superseding Congress. But first, on your money, the markets, the economy, and the whole works now. Joining us live, Brian Perry, Chief Investment Strategist and Portfolio Manager at Mint Asset Management at mintassetmanagement.com, also author of the 25% cash machine. Brian, thank you very much for taking the call here uh, on this epic day in uh, so many ways. Uh, give us your assessment of where things stand here at the moment. Thank you, Frank, and it's good to be on your show always. Uh, volatility is elevated due to you know some very key events here this week, what, uh, some of which you noted here on your opening comments here. 
Salesforce to you know lead that way. The, um, the earnings reports here for some of the big software names <clears throat> have not have not impressed, and there's there's a big reason for that here. You know, you've got this change into AI now is is starting to impact what are called you know software as a service type companies or SaaS. You know, it's um there's a connection going on here, and it's it's um it's important to note that the, you know the slowdown in enterprise software spending that's that we're starting to see in the guidance, um, the forward guidance of some of these companies here, like Salesforce, is kind of a crowding out effect here from the uh, uh, AI investments because, you know, there's um, while the, the, the some people may give the first quarter a pass because of, of this transition here, but there's some meaningful questions now about the adoption curve, um, you know, for for AI here and and the ultimate monetization of of you know um, what is uh, you know Gen AI. For what is called seat-based SaaS companies, because most of these software companies, they sell their subscriptions based upon how many employees are going to use their their products here. So you've got this emerging you know, effect now where AI is going to start replacing numbers of people in these companies, and that just that grinds on the uh, on the uh, renewal uh, subscription revenue for these big companies like Salesforce. So that's taken effect here, and we saw that happen here with MongoDB, which was down 31% in the after hours. Uh, we saw Dell. Um, they actually meet their their their, their they met their numbers and, and beat on the the top line, but it wasn't a big enough beat and down 22 percent. In two, it's been hammered for 17 percent. Um, you had Workday lose lose 20 percent also uh, just the other day. So it, it's a rougher environment now for cloud service providers here. But then again, it's for for those that maintain a position here in the big AI names where they are out front. I think that you use this kind of weakness in here to continue to initiate and add to the you know the core AI positions here in the big cap names. You know, second quarter GDP estimate came in here today and it was um it was down <clears throat> revised downward to 1.3% from 1.6%. Um this is the second revision here for the first quarter here. This is driven by downward revisions in consumer spending to 2% from 2.5%. That's important because the key takeaway is that uh, the two percent growth is in line with the previous eight quarters, um, and though spending was weaker than in the fourth quarter, it's not enough to really alter the market's soft landing outlook. And I think that was kind of voiced today by the New York Fed president here, uh, John Williams. He's a voting member. Uh, well, he said he, they saw ample evidence that the monetary policy is restrictive, meaning there's a better balance between supply and, and demand at this point in time here, which has him believing that you know the feds moving in this you know toward their target of 2% inflation we get this key number out tomorrow frank the P- the personal consumption expenditure index pce which yeah. is the fed's favorite inflation number and that's you know hopefully i think he kind of gave the bond market a wink and a nod today uh because we had a nice rally in the bonds um and we need, we needed that because we had such a sloppy week of treasury auctions here which which bumped rates you know considerably higher we 170 billion in treasuries went out the door and and they were you know they weren't well received so there's there's a lot of angst uh, <clears throat> about this this debt spiral also that's taking place here at the federal government level. And that's something we'll talk about later this hour. And, and uh, Salesforce uh, knocking NVIDIA off the uh, the headlines for a while. Of course, NVIDIA has been on a, on a record tear uh, following its uh, earnings news. It, it did come off its uh, record high today, down 43 and change to 1,105 here uh, for NVIDIA. Let's talk about uh, NVIDIA here now, uh, uh, obviously just off its all-time high What's uh, the outlook here based on what you just said about uh, SaaS and AI and adoption and so forth? Well, NVIDIA is, is way out front. They're the quarterback, you know, of the big AI game here. They're, they are this, you know, so far, um, you know, they're the Tom Brady of the uh, of the of of all the candidates here for AI. And you've got a company here trading at roughly 1100 here in the after hours, down 50 bucks on the close here. But still, uh it came out of a big base here. Technically, the stock looks like it wants to go higher. You've got a lot of price targets out there from 12 to 1600 on the stock. Uh, the um, th- this Blackwell chip will be coming out here later this year. That's their next generation from the H1 to H200 chips, and that's going to be four times to six times faster and have a higher capacity than the current chips. Uh, and that's where you know Nvidia is is really done a, a great job as I've noted that you know training their customers to buy all you can now because it, there's just you know there's so much out there that demand out there every company is is deploying an AI strategy uh, that has the capital to do so and so they are still a mile ahead of the competition here and will be so for a while and this is um, 
you know, that, that's something that you know, AMD and, and other companies that talk about making chips in the AI space, it's just still talk. You know, so uh, NVIDIA owns this market, and for the time being, Frank, the, 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 the runway here, even, even at this level here, the, the revised numbers higher for revenues and earnings here still make the, cho- the, the stock relatively cheap here, less than 35 times earnings going forward, growing at triple digits. So even as the stock has made its way higher here, the, Wall Street is continuing to pump their numbers up on, on the, the revenue top and bottom line growth for, for NVIDIA. So I, I think that if you do get this, this sympathy selling in here you know, by these other big uh, SaaS names, that and Nvidia does come in under a thousand or thereabouts. It's it's definitely a, a place you want to. Uh, if you don't own it, pick some up, and if you have some, maybe add to your position. On there live with investment expert Brian Perry, and and uh, after the uh, closing bell, we got that news uh, out of New York um, on that uh, President Trump uh, criminal case. And have we seen any um, significant reaction in the financial markets uh, to this? Uh, CNBC notes that the uh, major backers of President Trump are still going. Uh, full steam ahead. And also um, the other thing that happened, the uh, the president's DJT uh, stock price did tumble uh, following the news this afternoon. Any, anything else that's gotten your attention um, following the the news out of New York this afternoon? Well, futures are down just a tad here, like one-tenth of 1% here. So I think, you know, the market's really more focused on this inflation number here. This is going to go to an appeal, uh, you know, right away. I mean, there's a sentencing here on July 11th, I guess, is what they is, is what's being reported here. Who knows how that's going to go? It's it's going to be you know cast by the judge that oversaw this trial, so um, uh, it, it, that's a jump ball <clears throat> from my standpoint. I, I really don't want to try to speculate yep. on how that's going to go, but I think he's going to basically uh, you know be able to appeal this all the way through the the, the campaign season, um, assuming he can you know not not being you know have to go to jail for any period of time. The, um, and, and at the same time, I, I just don't see uh, the market really reacting one way or the other o- over at all okay. because it was kind of where we're the, you know, I think what we were looking at here was a court that was pretty well stacked in favor of the uh, prosecution. And what about uh, cryptos here? Uh, we're watching um, Bitcoin slide at about 300 here at 68,200 or so, Ethereum uh, slightly higher. Uh, we're watching uh, what's happening there. Uh, any thoughts about the uh, the crypto performance uh, lately here uh, after hitting uh, record highs uh, for uh, Bitcoin recently, uh, still hovering near that 70,000 uh, mark here for Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. Well, also, let me correct myself. The court was stacked for the prosecution. <laughs> I don't want to say that. Don't worry. The, um, yeah, but for, for crypto here, uh, yeah, we're at 68,000 and change. And I, again, I think it's starting to break out here with gold. I, I think the, both of these are a nervous market, tends to want to uh, you know, have other hedges in place, especially when you saw the treasury market here you know, kind of waffle this week. And that, that brought Bitcoin back up here toward the, you know, just under 70,000 here. So I, I'm, I'm of a believer that we're going to see more stress on, the, uh, on these treasury auctions here. So therefore, I think it's a, a bullish mechanism for both uh, Bitcoin and gold here. And Ethereum obviously had a great week last week here, but it's it's consolidating up here. Uh, in general, also you've got other things happening here, like Robinhood has now launched a new crypto trading platform for you know more professional type uh, crypto traders here. So there's um, there's just things happening in the crypto space that are making they're drawing in more institutional money uh, because they want to be able to put on a lot of different kinds of strategies here. And this is where I think that Bitcoin continues to to harbor. Um, you know, a lot of favor for those looking for an alternative asset class. Turning to the uh, retailers briefly, we did get uh, some earnings news on uh, some of the retailers. Uh, Costco beating profit and sales forecast, the stock pulling back from uh, record highs. Nordstrom shares down after uh, a wider than expected first quarter loss. Best Buy stock among the uh, the big winners today. Um, BBY up about uh, 13%. Um, the stock surges overall sales fell. Uh, and Gap stock jumped 20%. We're also watching what's happening uh, with Dollar Tree. It looks like they're going to be moving into some of the closed 99 cents only stores. Um, mixed mixed picture for the retailers. Um, Brian Perry, what do, you, what do you see happening in that space? Yeah, it's, it, you're seeing a continuation of a, a bifurcation of the retail stocks here with their higher end retailers. Some of them are doing pretty well, but but a lot of them are starting to show signs of stress uh, for, for premium brands. Uh, you know, And whereas... You've got much much more cost conscious buyers now stepping in. You know, Kohl's got crushed, and that's usually a pretty good place to you know find deals. Uh, but Best Buy going higher simply because they're saying they're going to be you know this whole refresh 
super cycle of AI enabled devices is going to be flowing through their stores going forward here. So uh, Best Buy got a bid despite the fact they missed their numbers. Uh, it's all about what, what what people see going forward here and not what you did yesterday. And that's how the stock market trades. So the um, at, at the same time, we're seeing you know general pressure on Home Depot and Lowe's here, uh, which is interesting here. You know, new new home sales were down here about seven percent for last month, um, and so there's uh, these higher interest rates, which you noted are are starting to, you know, weigh on on the uh, the remodeling business and the new homeowner business. So I'm I'm looking at, you know, where are people buying best. Costco had good numbers after the close. Stocks up, stocks stocks trading higher today after the close. Walmart did the same thing. They had good numbers, and they're starting to see more BMW show up in their parking lots. So it's it's an interesting time, Frank, because people are shopping, but they're being better shoppers of it. Um, and you also saw American Airlines, uh, you know, not a retail name, but but certainly a, a barometer of travel. So they they lower their guidance here. So um, there, there's people are watching their 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 pocketbooks a little bit more here. Uh, we don't know if that's that's uh, you know a longer term effect or a trend or whether that's just you know for right now. All right, Brian Perry, let me ask you the big question here now. As the month of May uh, draws to a close uh, tomorrow, uh, any specific places where you are putting money now and or taking it off the table? Certainly. Well, we've has, we've seen a, a nice consolidation here in, in the gold market here. So GLD and uh, the GDX, which is the gold miners, are, are both looking like they want to uh, move um, nicely higher here from uh, from where they currently sit. Um, I think again on this on this pullback here with this blow off in these uh, SaaS companies here, you do go in and, and take a look at the big companies that have a big AI uh, commitment here, and that's Microsoft, and that's Google, and that's Oracle, and that's Amazon. Those are the four you know cornerstone horsemen, if you will, of the of the magnificent seven that um, are, are going to be in not Oracle so much, but Amazon and, and Google and Microsoft. Uh, you've got a nice pullback here in uh, uh, Chipotle, 51, 50 for one stock split coming up here um, in the latter part of June. So uh, that stock looks good. CMG, I mentioned Robinhood, HOOD, looks good. Reddit looks really good here. RDDT as a new company here. And uh, Trade Desk uh, came came out uh, recently with a, a very fat deal with uh, Netflix here to you know, manage some of their advertising here, which has been a big part of Netflix's success recently. Also, for those big Formula fans out there, Formula One, Formula One fans, F W O N A is is uh, is the symbol for the Liberty Media Formula One stock that went public here about three months, three or four months ago here, and the stock's trading around 68. Had a big upgrade here, looking for 80 to 90 dollars a share today, so that looks good. And their their numbers came in nice; they were 50 percent growth um, from the uh, prior uh, prior quarter. And then lastly, Corning, uh, GLW, uh, is uh, a big uh, big recommendation today. Uh, looking for that to be a big part of the build-out of the data center. So you've got to have fiber, you know, to put in all these new servers to manage all this uh, all this AI, uh, um, you know, data. So uh, GLW looks good here, trading around 36, 37. Looking for the stock and maybe move around 43, 44. Coming off, um, it's nice to be able to trade in the aftermarkets here because, uh, you know, uh, Dell, uh, certainly I was, I was long that name. It had a big move, and I came off of that before today, before the uh, the numbers came out, as well as uh, Salesforce yesterday in the after hours, uh, before it really got clobbered today. DraftKings also, Frank, looks like it's going to be that and the other um, uh, betting stocks are under pressure here because Illinois just passed a new law taxing the uh, uh, the sports betting uh, companies here by, uh, you know, raising their taxes by as much as 50%. So that's uh, that's a no-go there. And then General Motors here, uh, China is looking like they're going to uh, levy some big t- tariffs on here on large engine vehicles going into China here. So that's a downer for the, the big cap uh, uh, automakers here in the U.S. Terrific, Brian. Wish, as always, we had more time, but we'll have to stop there. Thank you very much for that very thorough assessment of things here. As uh, the month of May uh, draws to a close tomorrow, we'll await that important inflation reading again uh, tomorrow morning. Brian Perry, Chief Investment Strategist and Portfolio Manager at Mint Asset Management at mintassetmanagement.com. Also author of the 25% cash machine. Brian, we wish you a good evening and thank you very much uh, for taking the call here this afternoon. You as well, Frank. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And right after the freeways now on 790 KBC. Well, like it or not, summer's coming. The days are long. Weather is warm. Swarms of tourists crowding the streets and freeways, and the pace may be slower, but the traffic, as you noticed, is getting heavier. You might be traveling, but with travel, you're driving in an unfamiliar place, and while you're having fun in paradise, unfortunately, accidents do happen. 
Now, if you've been hurt in an accident at home or away from home, don't let it ruin your trip or your summer. Call the compassionate team at Fielding Law Firm. Clark Fielding understands the disruption and frustration that comes with being injured in an accident that was not your fault. Clark Fielding is dedicated to getting you the justice and compensation you deserve. Whether it's a car accident, slip, trip, fall, dog bite, any kind of personal injury, Fielding Law is here to fight for you. Clark Fielding and his team of legal sharks at Fielding Law will help carry the burden so you can focus on recovery. You'll be treated like family. Fielding Law is a local firm that is familiar with the freeways and trouble spots out there. Clark Fielding lives right here, too. Don't let your summer be overshadowed by an accident. Call Clark Fielding's law firm today for a free consultation so you can focus on getting back to enjoying life under the sun. The number to call is 833-88-SHARK. 833-88-SHARK. Your path to brighter days ahead. Clark, the shark, law.com. Motaka Money continues here in 790 KBC. Good afternoon. Another pullback for stocks as we get set to close out the month of May. There was some selling in May and going away, it seems, at least in the second half of this month, with the Dow down 330 today at 3,811. Another uh, triple-digit move for the Dow, this time again on the downside, down three days in a row here now for a total loss of about 2.5% in the last three trading sessions. The S&P 500 down about 30 points today at 5,235. The Nasdaq tumbling 183 and a half at 16,000. 737. All the major averages kissed record highs this month. The yield in the 10 year note now at 4.55%. That's the one that impacts the uh, fixed rate mortgage rates. Uh, in case you hadn't heard, we did see mortgage rates tick higher again this week. Checking the cryptos now Bitcoin down about 300 at 68,292. Ethereum up 10 at 3,746. Doge at 16 cents. Salesforce among the casualties of the day down more than fifty-three dollars at two eighteen and chains down about twenty percent. Nvidia coming off its record high down forty-three and a quarter to eleven oh five. Eleven oh five is where Nvidia stands just below its all-time high. And now the latest news here on seven ninety KBC. Motaka Money continues here, 790 KBC. We're seeing sticker shock not only at the car dealerships these days, but pretty much across the board at the grocery store. Dining out, utilities, travel, retail, all, of course, a lot higher than it used to be. It turns out a big majority of Americans are worried about inflation. After nearly two years now, the Fed raising rates to more than 20-year highs and sending credit card rates to all-time highs. Inflation still running hotter than the Fed's target and certainly hotter than where consumers want it. Let's bring in right now Daisha Milden, staff editor for CNUT Money, who's just conducted a survey on all this. Daisha, thank you very much for uh, taking the call here this afternoon. Of course. Thank you for having me. Take it from the top uh, and tell us about this uh, latest survey you guys did there at CNUT. Yeah, so there are a couple of big takeaways. The number one thing that we definitely found was that 93% of Americans are concerned about inflation. And the biggest sticker shock that they're seeing when it comes down to what they're paying the most for, what they're surprised is so expensive, is groceries. And that's by 77%. When we really look a little bit closer, people are actually postponing purchases. Some are even having to tap into borrowing measures such as buy now, pay later, and even credit cards. So it's no secret inflation is high. Um, prices are definitely high as well. The best thing that we can do, even with all of these takeaways, is make sure that we're taking a really close look at our expenses, really evaluating those budgets, and keeping a really close track on that income coming in. Absolutely. So groceries, uh, that's that's the real eye popper, it looks like, here in your latest survey. What else uh, is out or near the top of the list here? Uh, certainly uh, gas prices get a lot of attention, and, and they've been moving up uh, this year again. Yeah, gas, right around 54%. Other um, areas that we saw that were surprising was dining out, and that's like right behind gas at 51%. Other ones that are also sticker shock are also utilities, clothes, and as we think about summer right around the corner, travel is there as well. So right across the board, no particular um, area where we're not really seeing that sticker shock. We're definitely seeing it across the board, whether it's everyday expenses or even thinking travel and clothes and electronics, subscriptions, you name it. Um, people are surprised by what they're having to pay. Pretty much across the board, and uh, obviously with uh, with gas and diesel, by the way, we should also mention, which is the lifeblood of the global economy, uh, still running hot. Uh, that also ripples through, uh, uh, pretty much hits everything out there. 
So, um, so people are uh, are dealing with it in in various ways. You mentioned, um, and of course, you made those great uh, suggestions. But uh, also, this impacts um, credit card rates too, which uh, the Fed, of course, uh, uh, impacts every time they raise the uh, the Fed funds rate. That impacts the the prime lending rate, which impacts the credit card rates, which have been pretty much standing at, at, at record highs here for the past couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's one of those things where you're going to have to really be careful about the debt that you are taking on. Um, at CNET Money, we did consult with our expert review board where they offer their expertise and advice. And one of our experts definitely told us, you want to make sure that you're being careful of the debt that you are taking on. So really taking a look at your budget, seeing how much debt you are actually able to take on, whether it's the extra $50 or $100 to cover that expense. And then once you've gotten yourself in a really good place, make that debt repayment plan to pay it back and pay it off as soon as possible. Really be careful of those terms and fees. Make sure that you have a really clear understanding of what the interest rate is because you did point out, yes, interest rates are high right now, so you know exactly how much you're going to be paying paying back in interest and what that looks like for the long term, the longer that it takes for you to pay it back. And another drain on budgets are these uh, subscriptions, which uh, sometimes sneak up on you, right? And uh, those two have been going up. What, what's your guidance on uh, controlling those uh, subscriptions that uh, you might have? Definitely a budgeting app. Keying all of that in, even linking your purchases, even linking your bank account, looking at what those subscriptions are. If you know that you regularly use, let's say, for example, three subscriptions, but you are subscribed to five, maybe it's time to cut those two. Or if you're really trying to save money, you may take those three subscriptions down to one or two and put that other money toward those other sticker shock items we talked about, gas, groceries, even utilities. Um, Every dollar adds up. And then, of course, there is uh, dining out. A lot of attention focused these days on uh, eye-popping menu prices for a variety of reasons, as the minimum wage has gone up here in California, for example. Uh, restaurants doing whatever they can to hold the line uh, on menu prices, but uh, a lot have just thrown in the towel and have just started raising prices, uh, charging for things that used to be free, for example, like bread and all of that. So uh, what's your guidance there for, for dining out? Maybe eat before you dine out? Yeah, there are a number of things that you can think about. For example, with the kids being out of school in my area, um, I saw recently a lot of restaurants posted that kids eat free on certain days. You may, instead of going on a Saturday night, you may choose to go on a Tuesday night um, where you may have a few more of those deals that you might not catch on the weekend. Um, Instead of, you know, maybe dining out, maybe this is a really good time to also consider doing a potluck. Um, I recently did it, and I got to say, it was a game changer in terms of money um, when everyone is able to bring something together. But my biggest piece of advice, if you are dining out, look for those deals. Look for those lunch deals where you could go, maybe eat the more expensive meals at home, and really think about where you're going and set a budget on when you do go out. Maybe you skip the appetizer to make sure that you stay within the budget, or maybe you split a meal. So there's a number of ways um, that you should definitely think about it going in the summer. Number one, if you have kids, look for those kids eat free or discounted meals. Excellent suggestions, and I only have heartily uh, mentioned uh, eating before you go out for dinner. Maybe have that bread uh, before you go out for dinner so you're not uh, famished when you hit that uh, menu uh, wherever you do end up uh, with, with everything so expensive. Well, fantastic. They should thank you very much uh, for taking uh, this call this afternoon and for sharing that important survey with us, which uh, folks can see there at uh, CNET Money. Daisha Milden, staff editor for CNET Money. Great to connect with you here. Thank you very much uh, for joining us live here this afternoon. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. All right, you too. And let's get right out to the freeways now. Gorgeous afternoon here in Southern California, 790 KBC. Moteca Money continues here, 790 KBC. Maybe take a bag of popcorn on the way to the restaurant. That'll uh, make you so hungry when you get there. We're talking some about some more of those uh, money-saving tips uh, for dining out and, and dealing with that uh, nasty inflation out there. Well, speaking of inflation, the federal government runs on a budget, kind of, and emergencies arise from time to time, but it looks like emergencies become part of the standard equation nowadays. Uh, We want to talk about that and what's happening with the federal budget, which uh, remains a big concern. Joining us live now is Romina Bacha, Director of Budget and Entitlements Policy at the Cato Institute, with an update on Uncle Sam's credit card bill, America's Mounting Debt Challenge, made even worse these days, and 
in recent years by so-called emergency spending, which is out of the purview of Congress. Romina, thank you very much for joining us uh, live here on this uh, big story. You've done, as always, a great job uh, taking a closer look at that. Tell us uh, what Mr. and Mrs. Southern California taxpayer need to, to know about this. Thanks for having me on. Uh, this is this has been really a growing issue that hasn't gotten much attention, neither in Washington nor across the country. Uh, and it's because it is a fairly recent issue in terms of how this is playing out, and that is emergency spending and um, the erosion of congressional fiscal norms that we are observing around this topic. It, you know, a lot of members of Congress and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, your const- uh, their constituents can be uh, um, excused for assuming that if Congress calls something emergency spending, then it, that, that it must be so. And this is certainly something that we observed often in the past. Uh, if you think back to, you know, uh, World War II, there was a, a huge amount of emergency spending. We also had a significant amount during the COVID pandemic, as well as before then during the Great Recession to boost uh, the economy. Uh, but after most of these episodes, um, after World War II, after the Great Recession, uh, we saw that uh, Congress would make an attempt at uh, repaying the debt, paying down the debt from that uh, temporary, what was considered temporary emergency spending. Um, even in, uh, in, in 2008 and 10, during the Obama administration, uh, there was a discussion over austerity, spending cuts. We got the Budget Control Act. Uh, when the debt limit uh, came calling. This has not been the case in recent years following the COVID-19 pandemic. So we want to bring attention to this issue and that this erosion of this fiscal norm, you might call it a Hamiltonian norm, that we will pay back emergency spending after the emergency has concluded is really important to the fiscal standing of our nation, to our ability to borrow during times of crisis uh, when we need to borrow, we need to give reassurance to bondholders and investors that those um, huge increases, in the ramp up in debt during a crisis will indeed be temporary, that the government will not just inflate away the value of the debt by continuing to add deficits and deficits on top of that emergency debt. Um, and if we don't send that strong signal, we may face much, much higher interest rates as investors uh, increasingly become concerned about the value of the dollars that they have have lent, if you will, to the U.S. government if we don't make a commitment to to pay down our debt as a crisis concludes. On the air live with Romina Bacha from the Cato Institute, all excellent points there and emergency spending of money we don't have. Remember during the financial crisis, remember Treasury Secretary Paulson at the time, um, they were talking about that enormous bailout for the banks and so forth, and they created... Uh, these various programs, HARP, uh, TARP, and um, and I jokingly told him at a, at a public forum, that, and, I, and I think there was also BARF, and he chimed, he said, that's what I did. He said he threw up um, over these the spending. Uh, this is <laughs> something you won't hear anyplace else, but that, that's what he said. Uh, so at what point does it become an issue that uh, that we all have to uh, to BARF here? Um, uh, at what point does the debt uh, become a, a bigger issue than it is today? No, I think it already is an issue. Um, one of our, we had a, an, an event on this, and one of our panelists, I think, made a, a, a very good observa- observation that um, the alarm bells are ringing loud and clear. We, we've seen several indicators that we are in debt danger zone. We saw Moody's and Fitch downgrade the U.S. credit rating. Um, uh, Moody's downgraded the outlook. Fitch downgraded the credit rating uh, just this year. Um, The IMF, the World Bank, the Congressional Budget Office, and the Office of Management and Budget, all of these nonpartisan entities, as well as many investors around the world are now saying, like, uh, and I quote my colleague here, whoa, things are getting pretty bad. We better do something. Um, And yet Congress is not uh, paying attention. And in part, it's because we're in the middle of an election cycle. And they would rather not talk about what's driving the growth in the debt and the reforms that will be necessary to make sure that the U.S. debt is stabilized and doesn't grow out of control, uh, eventually leading us uh, to uh, an even worse fiscal crisis than the one we're already in, because the current fiscal crisis is is one characterized by very high interest rates, 
A lot of Americans are experiencing this. If they're looking to buy a home, they're facing much, much higher interest rates uh, than in, in previous years, which is making it more expensive to borrow that money. Or if, they're, if they need to upgrade their car, um, they're, they're also facing higher loans, loan payments on, on, on those cars. Um, so that's, that's a crisis that we're already experiencing, as well as uh, the fact that inflation continues to be elevated higher than uh, what the Federal Reserve is targeting and seems to be pesky, very difficult to uh, bring back down. All of those are indicators that we're already in a uh, fiscally uh, uh, driven uh, debt crisis. And yet, um, like how, the question really is, like, how bad does it have to get? before Congress takes corrective action. And I'd like to uh, um, quote Kurt Couchman again, because I think he, he painted this very vivid image. He said, if you're tearing down the mountainside on a mountain bike, when do you know that you've gone off the cliff? Uh, off the cliff? It's when you're dropping really fast, and then you're screwed. Uh, and I thought we should, like, we're on that mountain bike going downhill. We see the cliff, we're already, you know, uh, uh, in unstable. Now it's time to hit the brakes. Uh, and so th I think that's really a question that constituents should ask law lawmakers who are running for re-election and presidential candidates as well is, what are you going to do about our debt crises? Not the future debt crises, but our debt crises today, bringing down inflation, bringing down interest rates. And the way to do that is to uh, cut government spending because that's what's driving inflation and that's what's driving the debt, which is... Uh, driving up interest rates. Excellent points. Uh, as always, Romina, and we'll uh, look for your uh, writings of the Cato Institute as, as well as on X, formerly known uh, as Twitter. And and certainly uh, inflation is running hot. We'll be getting a new rating on inflation first thing uh, tomorrow morning. The last time uh, in a political, a presidential political race that the debt was uh, made a big issue, of course, was back in 92 when third party candidate Ross Perot was running when uh, he said something like, uh, in order to s see the problem, um, you got to open up the hood. And uh, I think you've just opened up the hood for us here and, and described it so beautifully. Romina, thank you very much for taking the call live with us here this afternoon. Thanks for having me. That is Romina Bacha with the Cato Institute, Director of Budget and Entitlements Policy at the Cato Institute. Big news today. I'm proud to report as a dad, Catherine has graduated from first grade. Stay tuned now for the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang. And I'll be back with more at 4 tomorrow. Motec on Money, 790 KBC. What's up, everyone? It's Reality Steve, your number one source for all things Bachelor Nation and reality TV. Every day, I'm giving you the behind-the-scenes juice and your info on all your Bachelor Nation stories and also interviewing some of your favorite reality stars. My name has been synonymous with spoilers, but I'm so much more than that. Give me a listen. The Reality Steve Podcast, part of the Believe Network. Just search B-L-E-A-V on YouTube or wherever you listen.